Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford. He is my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from disparate locations at Lambeau Field, and uh, it is draft week. Welcome to draft week, Wes. Are you ready for this upcoming three-day extravaganza? Yeah, it's exciting time, Mike. I'm, I'm excited to get back at it. You know, when you look at the NFL draft, this is the time of the year. It, it's all this consternation, all this talk, all this discussion. Well, over these three days, Thursday through Saturday, we'll finally get some answers. 256 picks, whatever gets made. And as we learned last year, there are no mystery relevance in this thing. Uh, and the <laughs> Green Bay right. Packers, as things stand right now, have 10 picks. So, uh, an exciting time once again to to see what all this hustle and bustle and discussion really can amount to. All right. Well, you and I don't normally get into the prediction business, but that's about all we have left to do in terms of previewing this draft is to just throw out a few predictions, so to speak, that uh, that we might have. The first one I want to ask you about is when, if will this Aaron Rodgers trade go down? Do you think it happens before the draft? Do you think it happens during the first round? Do you think it happens during the second round? What's your gut tell you right now, as far as the timing of this pending Aaron Rodgers trade to the New York jets? Well, again, just being someone that's seeking closure on this whole thing, I'm going to try to steer (laughs) on the side of optimism here and say that it does get done before. And obviously there were some reports out over the weekend that the talks between the Packers and jets have kind of ramped up again. And, and frankly, as I've said before, and was one of my sign offs last week, you know, you're so appreciative of everything that Aaron Rodgers did here, but obviously, you know, it was a month ago now that I was in Arizona and, Brian Goodikens mentioned, you know, they're working to facilitate this trade. So it's all been building up towards this. And no matter what you and I write, Mike, I feel like it's always coming back to, well, what is happening with the quarterback situation? When is the trade going to happen? And if it does, what does that mean now for the Packers moving forward? And I just kind of wanted some answers. So I'm hoping it's before round one. It'd be interesting if it's on Friday. I just feel like that's such a weird timing in terms of. Yeah. You know, both the Jets and the Packers at that point, as weird as this sounds when you're dealing with a four time MVP quarterback, they have more pressing matters at the moment in terms of trying to shuffle out what the rest of their roster is going to look like. But, you know, we've learned time and time again, there's no deadlines on these things. And if you go back to 2013, 10 years ago, Michael, the Green Bay Packers work their actually be their second extension with Aaron Rodgers just before round one. Would be curious to see what would happen potentially 10 years later if the Packers could end up finally finalizing that trade for him to New York. Yeah. I've been trying to figure out if this happening on Friday night, as the second round gets underway, makes some sort of sense. And I've gone back and forth on it because we heard Brian Gutekunst at the league meetings in Phoenix say that the Jets first round pick number 13 overall in this draft is not necessarily a requirement from the Packers point of view to get this deal done. So you go, okay, well, the Jets have two picks in the middle of the second round right near where the Packers second round pick is as well. So you're thinking, well, then maybe it won't happen until Friday, but if you're Brian Gutekunst and you're potentially going to get a second round pick or, or an asset like that, wouldn't you want to have that, on Thursday night in case you want to move up or move around in the first round. If you wait until Friday to make the deal for a second round pick, then any maneuverability as far as the first round on Thursday night is kind of out the window. So I, I think my best guess, again, this is a guess, but I think this trade gets done either right before the draft starts on Thursday, or maybe just within the first few picks to where suddenly, you know, there's going to be around pick three or pick four, there's going to be some, you know, breaking news that the trade has been finalized. It's been turned into the league. I, I just think the Packer, even, even if Brian Gutekunst is not going to move around a bunch in the first round, I still think if he's getting a second round pick as part of this deal, he's going to want at least the option, um, at least the, the availability to do that. So that that's just my gut feeling on this, but uh, um but we'll have to see. It was interesting, though, I thought, to hear Gutekunst to go on the record to say that the Jets' first-round pick, number 13 overall, is not some sort of prerequisite or requirement for the Packers to make this deal for Aaron Rodgers. That that sort of caught my ear when he said that at the end of March. Mike, 
have you ever sold a snowblower before? Have no, I've ever... only bought snowblowers. I've never sold okay. one. Have you ever sold a lawnmower? No. Have you ever sold a car? Yes. yes. Okay. So let me ask you this. When you got the compensation for the car, that goes into your bank account, right? It goes into your wallet. You can go spend it for other things. Have you ever tried to walk into, uh, let's say, Meyer, for example, and tried to buy something with a car? Probably doesn't work, right? You yeah. need the monetary value. Yeah. That's where I fall on this Rogers thing because it's like, you're you're right, man. They could wait until Friday, Yeah. work a deal, see what happens. But But at the same time, there's so much spendable cash. If you have, let's just say it'd be two second rounders. Well, if you have the two second rounders on Thursday, you could still move around, you know, with the 15th pick. That's why I kind of go back to, you know, if you can get this thing done before the first round begins. Now, if you can't, you can't, but the assets and the liquidity is so much greater. I feel the earlier that this thing gets done. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like I've said before, the Green Bay Packers feel really good about Jordan Love. The Jets obviously have really hitched their way into the idea of Aaron Rodgers being their quarterback. And now you and I will be sitting around drinking our coffee, waiting for the rest of the chips to fall. Yeah. Well, outside of the potential Aaron Rodgers trade, the Packers are sitting at number 15 in the first round. They're sitting at number 45 in the second round. We've seen... We've seen Brian Gutekunst move up in the first round where he drafted Darnell Savage. He drafted Jordan Love with trades up in the first round. We've seen him move back in the first round. We've seen him move back and up in the same first round the year he got Jair Alexander. So what's your gut feeling here with the Packers sitting at number 15? Do you think, do you think it's a trade up? Do you think it's a trade back? Do you think it's a sit and pick situation? Obviously it all depends on, who, you know, who goes in those first 10 or 12, you know, as, as things unfold, but what, uh, what's your gut say in terms of uh, what the Packers do with the 15th pick? Mike, I don't know anything. And obviously that's an evergreen statement, but <laughs> I, this to me feels a lot like 2018. If I'm being honest with you, when the Packers were originally sitting at 14, they moved back. The, the New Orleans saints came up to take Marcus Davenport. The Packers ultimately settled, not settled, but found, uh, Jair Alexander at 18 after moving around when you're picking in the middle of the pack like that it's such an interesting spot because your assets are aligned in such a way that you could move up a few spots or you could potentially move back a little bit too depending as you said on how the board falls I think a lot of this is going to have to do with those four quarterbacks how early do those guys go off the board I would imagine they all will be off the board before 15 but the earlier the better uh, in terms of, you know, Green Bay's standpoint and being able to maybe get a, a top player at tight end or defensive line, what have you. But also, what is the trickle down effect of that? You're seeing reports now of the Minnesota Vikings potentially having interest in Will Levis. So sure. could they move up? You know, how does that affect the board? 15 is such a malleable pick in terms of where you go and where you sit. I think out of all the scenarios, and as you outlined, Brian Gutekunst has exercised them all in five years. But to me, I think the most unlikely is for them just to sit at 15. Now, it's not to say they won't, but I just feel like the positioning of the board, the depth of this first round, and also the fact the Packers do have those 10 picks right now really creates a lot of intrigue there for what potentially Green Bay could do. I Yeah, and in addition to the quarterbacks, because the, the quarterbacks always you know dictate how the first round goes from, from a league-wide perspective. The other thing I think that's that's – going to have a big impact here are those top four offensive tackles. When you're talking about Skaronsky, Jones, Paris Johnson Jr. and Darnell Wright, those guys are pretty much considered, you know, the, the elite, the top four offensive tackles in this draft. And once, you know, the first one or two of those guys goes, and then there's only say two of them left on the board the teams that are really, really in need of fixing, you know, either a left tackle or a right tackle spot and want to get one of these top guys in the first round and not wait around and take their chances on a, a, on a, you know, a lesser evaluated player. I think that's where we could start to see some movement. So the quarterbacks are going to have their say in, uh, in the movement and how things go. But I think the offensive tackles are going to play a part in that too, just because there seems to be such a, um, you know, such a solid grouping of these are the top four, and then there's sort of everybody else 
um, at those offensive tackle spots. Well, and, and then honestly, Mike, think about it because you're always going to, you know, Will Anderson is going to come off the board. Obviously, Jalen Carter has a couple more questions now where he could potentially fall. It's always doing simple math and just figuring out, okay, there's, there's certain guys that could be there and there's certain guys who undoubtedly will not be. And if you run those numbers, it really does put you in a situation if you're Brian and if you're the Packers personnel department where, I mean, there's going to be six, seven guys who are going to potentially be there for you. Who do you like the most out of that grouping? And then, by the way, if they're all there, then that's probably where it gives you the flexibility to move back. It's the game that must be played. But I'll, the, the last thing I'll leave you with on this topic is I was sitting earlier this, you know, on Sunday morning and I was thinking about, OK, draft week is finally here. Right. And about how Brian Gutekunst somewhere in Green Bay, Wisconsin, is sitting around probably with his family or, you know, doing what have you. And I'm like, the decisions he's going to make, the 10 cards or more or less that he turns in, the the trickle-down effect that that's going to have on so many young men's lives around the yeah. country at this very time. Uh, I was watching the video that I don't even know if it's up at the time of this is posting, but the interview that Larry McCarron did with Quay Walker and seeing that video again of Clay in his living room with all of his family surrounding him. It is a life-changing moment that is going to not only affect this franchise's history, but also these individuals. So it's the exciting prospect of finding a real talent, uh, a somebody that regardless of position is going to be a playmaker in Green Bay for 10, 12 years. And ultimately that decision lies in the hands of Brian Gutekunst. Yeah, well, you said it in terms of uh, with the Packers being at 15, it, it feels like there are going to be a handful of players that I think the Packers are going to like that they're going to have strong evaluations on, have very strong feelings about, and they're going to have their pick of, of uh, what direction they want to go. We talked about this a little bit on our last show, but I want to follow up with it again. What position do you think, you know, in that scenario, say there's four or five guys at some different spots, the Packers all have them, you know, graded relatively equally and, and uh, you know, which is a nice spot to be in. Which position do you think they go with? Yeah, and out of any years in which I've covered the draft, this is actually number 14 for me already going back to when I was just helping out at the Press Gazette in 2010. This is the year I think I'm, it reminds me the most of 2014, where I was like, hey, Ryan Shazier, CJ Mosley, haha, Clinton Dix. There's so many different ways Green Bay could go, and I think all those decisions could help them. But if, if I was to do a mock draft right now, I think it comes back to Lucas Van Ness for me. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more that he makes sense. And in a lot of ways, he kind of reminds me of Clay Matthews. He's much bigger than Clay, you know, about 20 pounds heavier. But this is one of those type of guys that you didn't really get the full feeling of his potential at Iowa. He wasn't a starter every year, but he would fit the prototype for them. And I think as you've talked about a couple of times, I mean, there's a couple of these guys in that 6'5", 270 range, almost that, that Preston Smith type range where I don't think you could go wrong. And if for a guy like Van Ness, if he comes in and needs to be a rotational guy right away, like he kind of was at times at Iowa, well, he's still going to have the flexibility to do that. So as deep as this draft is at a number of positions, I want to sort of test that depth a little bit at tight end. I want to test that depth at offensive line or receiver and go out and get what is probably going to be the best available pass rusher at 15. So the answer to your question is edge rusher. And to be more specific, I think Lucas Van Ness is the guy that could potentially be that fit. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, uh, you know, all else being equal in the scenario that the, the very sort of basic boring scenario I laid out, I'm inclined. I'm inclined to think the Packers are going to go edge rusher. I do think Lucas Van Ness would be, uh, would be a guy very high on their board. The other one, that I talked about on our last show with that Preston Smith build, Miles Murphy from from Clemson, I think could potentially fit there too. Some people might say 15 is a little bit high for Murphy, but at the same time, um, there aren't uh, you know there there are the there are the edge rushers who are in that you know 240 250 range, and then there yeah. are the edge rushers that are in the 265 to 275 range, and there's a big difference there because you know, you talk about a guy like Van Ness and, and you see this on the tape at Iowa where he would move inside and become an interior rusher in certain sub packages, certain third downs and things like that. And we've seen, you know, with, 
with the Smiths, with Rashawn Gary over the years here in Green Bay, that the Packers like to do that. I'm sorry, if you draft an edge rusher who's 245 pounds, he's not lining up as a three technique on third and eight, you know, to give you a different look in the pass rush. He's going to be out on the edge. You don't have that flexibility. That's where the body type thing comes into it for me in terms of, uh, in terms of looking at that. I wanted to ask you as well, as far as, uh, you know, your, your favorite guys, so to speak at certain positions. And when I say favorite guys, I mean, guys that realistically could be available for the Packers, either in say the first round or the second round, you know, Thursday night or Friday night, you mentioned Van S at, at the edge. I'm totally on board with that. I also like Murphy from Clemson, um, defensive line, um, with the Packers obviously moving on from Jaron Reed and Dean Lowry and and looking for a big step forward from Devontae Wyatt and TJ Slayton, is there a defensive lineman out there within you know the first fifty picks that that you think maybe fits Green Bay? And can I do, if we're going to do the favorite topic? Can I start with something else though? Sure, I'm kind of yeah. st- I'm taking the ship from me for a second. That's because okay. As, as soon as you said favorite, the first guy that popped in my head is Darnell Washington. And the reason why okay. I, I, it, it ties in really quickly. Now, this is not a defensive lineman, although shoot, the kid could probably play there with, probably with how big could he is. play there. Yeah. But, but the big reason I just want to mention that Michael is when we were talking about 15 and potentially moving back or acquiring more picks, if the Packers don't want to go Kincaid at 15, Washington is the type of guy, probably a little bit like Murphy, where if you move to the end of the first round or maybe even move up a little bit in the second, that could be a really good fit for them. Washington is the guy I've kind of labeled as the baby Mercedes a little bit, just because of the amount of athleticism in a huge body. And I feel like at some point, Mike, I don't know if it's the first round, second round or third round, those first two days before you and I are walking out of Lambeau field, the Green Bay Packers, I feel are going to draft a tight end. I just, when you look at the makeup of them, I know there's Mayher, excuse me, Michael Meyer, fantastic player, really good inline blocker. I think that's why a lot of people are high on him. Dalton Kincaid brings a lot to the party, Sam Laporta, all these different guys. But when I looked at the film, and again, I'm not a scout, but when I looked at the film, Darnell Savage is the type of player, or excuse me, Darnell Savage, Darnell Savage too. But (laughs) Darnell Washington is the type of player that makes me just be like, man, I wish training camp was here already because I want to see this kid play. Yeah, I... I, I'm with you in the sense that I, I I like actually a lot of these tight ends. Washington Washington is in his own category in terms of the type of the type of player he is, the type of physical presence and everything that he is. I don't know if the Packers are going to go tight end in in round one, which I think would be either Mayer from Notre Dame or Kincaid from Utah. If you go if you go tight end in round two and you want to target a guy like Washington or if you want to stay in the middle of the second round or maybe even move back a little bit in the second round, the uh, um, uh, Musgrave from Oregon state could potentially be a good fit at tight end too. And you're still getting one of the top four or five tight ends in this draft. So I, I think, I think all of those are, are possibilities, but Washington, Washington is the one who just, who sticks out because he's different, right? Yeah. He's, he's a, he's a different breed of cat and, uh, and very intriguing in terms of, uh, of how this tight end, the order of the selection of the tight ends could unfold the Thursday and Friday. Thank you for humoring me. Now no. we can get back to the Mike Spofford Packers unscripted. That was, that was planned. No, it's okay. I, just, I was, I mean, tight end was on the list. So oh, was he? Okay. I, I just got to check off, you know, I'm checking off all the, moving uh, around the different positions. So yeah, we've talked about edge. We've talked about tight end. So where do you want to go next? Wes, you De- pick it. Defensive line though. Still, all right. Cause, cause Brian Breezy, you know, Clemson, this is a kid that when you look at losing a Dean Lowry type, he, he fits that role, right? Six foot six, 300 pounds can probably put a little bit more onto that frame. He's had to weather a few things, but I I think when you look at the makeup, when you're looking at guys that could potentially complement a Kenny Clark or a a, a Devontae Wyatt, he he is the guy. And in reading off and doing some of these prospect primers with him, he's definitely one of the the dudes that the the more I read about him, the more I learned about his story. He he seems like a Green Bay Packers type of player. And and I'd be interested to see if that potential guy was there. Also the Northwestern kid. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. Um, yeah. That doesn't have the same type of size, but Mike, we've learned time and time again now with these defensive linemen, especially these three techniques, six foot two, 298 pounds is no longer a deal breaker in this league. If you can get the guy that you're lined up across from to get on his heels. Yeah. Brzee from Clemson is the guy I really like on the defensive line. I agree with you. I think he's, I, I think he's a really good fit for the, 
this uh, this Packers system, what the Packers like to do with their defensive linemen, what they what they ask them to do. That being said, you know, we're talking about edge and D line and tight end and you're not going to be able to draft everybody you want in the first two rounds. Right. I mean, Thursday and Friday night are going to go by and all of these, uh, you know, different spots that we're talking about, the Packers aren't going to be able to address them all. So these are, these are various favorites that we're talking about, but knowing realistically that the Packers can't get all of these guys. Um, but, uh, but you hope that maybe things fall a certain way or that, uh, that Brian Gutekunst can move around on the board as such to, uh, to maybe get some of them. The uh, the other another spot to ask you about wide receiver. I know Jackson Smith Jigba is is your guy um, and he may be there at 15 for Green Bay and he may present a very, very intriguing um, prospect here in the fact that uh, the Packers haven't drafted a wide receiver in the first yeah. round for a couple of decades now, but he may be there. Aside from aside from him, any other uh, any other receivers that uh, that you have your eye on in this draft? Yeah, this is the other thing. I wish I could say the whole tweet, but it is incredible the amount of kind of smaller receivers in this year's draft. I, I forget who who put it out there, one of the draft experts, but the amount of guys under five ten and the amount of guys under one hundred ninety pounds yeah. uh, in the top one hundred or two hundred of prospects. It is incredible. I mean, we're just really quickly reeling this off. You know, Zay Flowers goes out of uh, Boston College, five foot nine, 182 pounds. I mean, Jordan Addison, USC, 5'11, 173. Tyler Scott from Cincy, 5'10, 177. Josh Downs, UNC, 5'9, 171. Jalen Hyatt is probably the next guy I look at if it's not going to be in Jig, you know, Smith and Jigba. Because again, he fits more of that six foot one, got a little bit more of that size to him, similar to what the Packers have gone with, with a, a Romeo Dobbs, a Devonte Adams in the past, the Packers so many years, Mike, they put in really big assets into six foot four receivers, 200 plus pounds. There ain't a lot of them in this year's draft class in terms of at least the, the high end ones. So um, finding out exactly where the Packers decide to spend that pick is going to be really interesting because at some point they have to draft a receiver but I'll be just really interested in a draft where there's so many talented guys that don't necessarily maybe meet the Ron Wolf, you know, sort of standard in terms of size, yeah. uh, which guys the Packers could potentially roll the dice on. Yeah, you're right. You're right in that there are a lot of these, a lot of these smaller, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the cat quick, the classic slot receiver, you know, type, not, not to, not to peg or, or stereotype these guys too much, but, but they seem to fit, you know, those, uh, those type of labels, the other one, and I've, I've been talking about them, you know, having done a prospect primer on them that I'm really curious because I, I've seen evaluation scouting reports all across the board on Quentin Johnston from yeah. TCU. There, there are some scouts that really, really like him. There are some that just that, that question how consistent his hands are and whether he's going to be able to be, you know, a consistent pass catcher in the NFL, but he caught my eye right away because he is almost the exact same size as Christian Watson. He same just doesn't, weight. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't run a four three. He runs a yeah. four five. He's which is not exactly slow, but he's not the uh, he's not the the speed burner that uh, that Watson is. That being said, more often than not, the Packers have invested draft picks at the receiver position on the bigger bodies, not necessarily the smaller bodies. And so that's why I wonder, you know, where, uh, where he fits and not to say that I don't think he's would be in play for the Packers at 15 overall in the first round, but depending on what happens with the Rogers trade, your second round assets are then potentially what, uh, what things look like in the third round. Um, with uh, with some of the negative things that I've seen about about Johnson from TCU, maybe he's still on the board in the third See, round. I mean, who the heck knows? Yeah, he's probably more than any other receiver I can remember in terms of just the the discrepancy of where scouts have this kid. Yeah. In terms of you know, some of them will have him as the top receiver on the board. Some of them have him underneath some of those other receivers that I mentioned. What is intriguing to me though about him is you, you mentioned the comparisons to Christian Watson. We've touched on that before. But it's also he does remind me a lot of Watson in terms of how the scouts are kind of like confused in terms of where this kid should be drafted. Right. There were people that thought that Christian Watson was a hands down top 20 player last year. There were people that said there's no way you can spend a first round pick on this kid. I think 34 ended up being a pretty good compromise because the Packers moved up, basically treated him like a first round pick to be able to get him at that spot. 
but didn't waste much time on day two and doing it. I mean, they, they turned in that card pretty quick after acquiring the second pick of day two. So um, he's going to be one man. There's a number of these kids and Darnell Washington is one of them too, where I don't know where they're going to go, but as long as they're on the board, my eyes are going to be kind of gravitating toward their name. Yeah. I'm going to be very curious to see how that unfolds. One other spot I want to ask you about, we already talked a little bit about the offensive tackles and that top group, but do you have a guy who's a, who's a favorite in that bunch that maybe is going to intrigue green Bay in terms of how they navigate the first and second rounds of this draft? Well, and like I've said to you before, the Peter Skaronsky thing is interesting because it depends on how you look at his situation, because as I touched on, he has shorter arms, but the Packers really like guys that could potentially play multiple positions. Skaronsky is that guy. I think he is athletic enough and talented enough. He's going to be able to be just fine at right tackle. There's guys more. I read about him that are just absolutely convinced that this kid is going to be a 10 year starter in the NFL at tackle. No questions asked after Saturday night, we're never going to be talking about his arm length again, but Paris Johnson's the one I have always kind of identified as probably the most ready-made prospect. Um, I just, I like the pedigree. Obviously there's a history there of that program, but also the standpoint of you can't teach six, five, you can't teach 310 pounds. And if there is an aspect, when you look at the guys that have truly succeeded in green Bay at that tackle position, that's kind of been the commonality. David Bakhtiari, people thought he was too small. David Bakhtiari's height was never a problem. He put on a couple pounds. The kid was just fine. Brian Balaga was as ready made as they probably come in terms of going from Iowa to the NFL. Paris is sort of the guy that I look at in terms of if you want just a consistent, steady, probably guy you can insert on day one and let him fly. That that's the guy I feel the best about. Yeah. And what's interesting, if, if the Packers go that route, they don't necessarily need him to step in right away yes, on correct. day one, right? But yeah. that being said, to to have that type of uh that type of insurance policy at offensive tackle, assuming you're going into the season with Bakhtiari on the left side and Yash Nyman on the right side, to have that kind of an insurance policy if something happens um is uh is not a bad spot to be in. I've mentioned him before and, and it it just when I see six foot five, three hundred and thirty pounds and a guy who can move like Darnell Wright from Tennessee, it just it catches my eye. And I know there are a lot of things out there in terms of you know, I, I don't, I don't like to read too much into it, but there's stuff out there about his attitude and this and that, and the other thing. And it's like, I'll let the scouts sort that out. I don't know if the Packers like, uh, like this young man or not, but, uh, but when you, when you look at the film and you look at what he did in the sec six foot five and three thirty, and a guy that, uh, a guy that feels like, you know, again, you could you could just say, all right, here's a here's a right tackle for the next decade in the NFL, and you don't have to worry about that spot. That always uh, that always becomes a, an intriguing option to me. The last thing I just want to mention too, yeah. I, I know sometimes you can run into problems with the height thing, and you know with offensive linemen, Green Bay Packers have not been deterred by that. You look at Caleb no. Jones and Yash Nyman; they they go and they'll get offensive linemen, they'll teach them pad level, they'll be good there. Well, the dra- Packers drafted a six five center in the yeah. second round a couple <laughs> years ago. I mean, six foot five playing center, and you know Josh Myers is uh, is, is doing his thing just fine. So. Yes. So so in that idea, uh, Blake Freeland uh, from BYU, six foot eight, uh, incredible cool. build. Uh, a lot of frame to work with, you know, only around the 300 pound range. But again, if you're looking at guys and that's what I'm doing here, you know, again, that's probably the reason I'm not as high on Skaronsky as other people. Cause I, I feel like the Packers have plenty of talent for the interior offensive line. It's more about what are they looking at in terms of the future at the outside tackle positions, right? He's another guy that kind of fits probably more that Jared Valdir sort of, you know, taller, more slender, but if you teach him the right fundamentals, he's going to give you a heck of a bang for your buck. Yeah, definitely. Um, a little bit of sponsor business here, Wes, and then I just got a couple more questions for you. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. All right. One of my last questions for you, are the Packers going to draft a kicker? The more and more, the closer we get to the draft, Mike, um, again, I don't know what's happening with Mason Crosby, but the more convinced I am that Jake Moody is 
going to potentially be a guy that you could pick on day three. Um, I actually was hanging out with a good friend of mine, Michael Cohen, you know, Michael as well. Yes, uh, I do. He got to cover him at Michigan and he's, he was pretty convinced that this kid is going to be a pretty talented player has a heck of a leg. Uh, as recently, I think is probably two weeks ago in inbox. I was writing, ah, I just don't know if anyone's going to have a draftable grade. I'm not exactly sure if, you know, do you want to spend one of the picks on the kicker, but with as many day threes of the picks as the Packers do have, um, Moody's the one that'll test it. If he's there, if he's available and it makes sense, uh, he was the one I would consider. If not him, I- I'm not, I'm still not really sold. I'm not sure. I mean, I, there's some draft outlets I think that don't even have a kicker in the top 300 on their board. So, but, but Moody definitely has an NFL leg and could potentially be the guy that gets brought in. And uh, it's been 15 years since the group, 16 years since the Green Bay Packers have drafted a kicker. 16 so if, years, yeah. if Mason Crosby's not coming back, out of any free agent kicker on the market, regardless of the fact he's 38, I would still go with Mason Crosby. So if it's not going to be Mason, if that, if again, we'll see what happens, but it, for me, it's draft or nothing. If, if the, if you're moving on from, from Mason. Yeah. All right. Last one for you, Wes. And this is kind of a, you can take this any direction you want to, but come next, when we do our next show in the early part of next week, and we are reviewing the draft, what is the, what is a topic that is going to be very high on the discussion list that we have not necessarily been talking a whole heck of a lot about in our pre-draft episodes here? What do you think? Yeah, Drafting a quarterback. Uh, I I think that's going to happen over the three days, especially if the deal goes down with Rogers. We we know the situation with the Packers. I've talked at numerous times about how I'm not a guy that's typically wanting to just throw money at a veteran backup just to have one. Uh, I like potentially developing a young guy, uh, who could that be? Because if you look outside of Jordan Love, the Packers haven't really dipped into those waters very often. Uh, and really now the last, what, eight eight years. So that would be the position I'm kind of looking at. Uh, even, even when in terms of undrafted free agency, the Packers haven't signed a lot of quarterbacks lately. They've had, you know, your Danny Etlings and, and some of these veterans that have been around a little bit and been the practice squad guy. So I'd be very interested to see who they potentially pick. And if they make the decision that love is the guy you're moving on from Aaron Rodgers, do the Packers follow suit to what Ted Thompson did in 2008 and actually draft a quarterback in those, not maybe the first round, but in those earlier rounds to see if you you have a young guy there that you potentially like. Yeah. I, I think, I think the topic we're going to be talking about next week and it's going to, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be some confusion with it. And when I say confusion, I don't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. But I think we're all going to be trying to figure out what are the Packers doing going to do in the secondary? Because I think at some point in this draft, the Packers are going to take a corner and they're also going to take a safety. But we're going to be trying to figure out, okay, so you have Alexander and and Rasul Douglas on the outside. You brought back Keyshawn Nixon to play the slot. You have Eric Stokes coming back from the injury and where does he fit? And then there might be another cornerback draft pick in the mix. And then at safety, Right now, Savage and Ford would probably be your two starters based on how the roster sits. But if you draft a safety in the third or fourth round, is that a guy who could legitimately compete, you know, for a starting spot at safety or, you know, you know, as perhaps, a, you know, a dime roll or something like that? I think there's going to be a lot of things up in the air with regard to just what the Packers secondary is going to look like. And I think it could be some some fun discussion. Cause I think, uh, I think ultimately the Packers are going to have some options there, especially if we find out somewhere along the line that all of the recovery news with Eric Stokes and coming back to, you know, to be in that top group of corners with this team and be healthy and ready to go. If that, if that indeed is the scenario, where does uh, Brian branch go in your mind? Because the way I look at it is it's kind of like taking like in your fantasy football draft, taking Travis Kelsey, where you're going to get, you know, hands down the top guy at that position, but right. there's going to be depth in other areas. Where, where do you think a team potentially moves on him? I I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's going to be in the bottom, in the bottom quarter, you know, the last seven, eight picks of the first yeah. round, I think maybe is where he goes. I think where the Packers are sitting in the middle of the first round, that just, that just feels too rich for, um, for that type of selection could be wrong. Who knows? We never know exactly yeah, what these yeah. teams I'm think putting of you on guy. the spot. I was just curious. Yeah, no, but, but I, I, I think, I, I think a guy like that is 
uh, is a first round pick and a first round talent, but it's probably more, you know, the, the back end, the last six, eight picks of the first round. That's just my best guess. Yeah. Because it's that, that's what I'm most excited to see on Thursday night, Mike, is that we talk about these offensive tackles and these quarterbacks and these defensive linemen, edge rushers, tight ends. Um, somebody has to fall. And it's always interesting yep. seeing teams play that dance in terms of, okay, we really like these type of players, but then now you have the top prospects at these positions. The Packers ran into that situation in 2019. Darnell Savage was the first defensive back taken in that draft, not safety first defensive back taken in that draft and always trying to figure out exactly where those boards are going to fall. Can't wait to see it. It's going to be another exciting NFL draft. Yeah, well, rest up the rest of this week, Weston, because come Thursday night, Friday night, and all day Saturday, we got some long nights and some long days ahead. But uh, but it should be fun. It's the it's the most important three days of any off season uh, for the Green Bay Packers. So we certainly get geared up for it every year. With that, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. We will be back with more episodes following the draft to review all the picks and resume all of these discussions. So for Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time.